I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum computers and why people care so much about them. Because what they're going to do is apply this machine to an area that I think is fundamentally important. It's the crux of our future as humans. And that's, can we build machines like us? Now, imagine a virtual human. Not made of flesh and bone, one made of bits and bytes. And not just any human, but a virtual version of you. Accurate at every scale, from the way your heart beats, down to the letters of your DNA code. It is called a digital twin, and it represents a new era in simulation. A new world of predictability. A promising new tool for engineering the future. A digital twin is a complete virtual prototype of an entire system. They are building false realities into which they want to induct you so they can play God. Brain-to-machine interfaces open up the possibility of avatar technology. Not simply controlling an external limb or a computer screen, but controlling an entire artificial you allowing you to be effectively in two places at the same time. A frequency is emitted from a device and hits the target at the resonant frequency that that target's body, brain, and DNA are already resonating at, already vibrating at. They sync up and there is, for lack of a better term, a frequency superhighway that is connected between the device and the targeted individual. In a quantum computer, that device can be in this strange situation where these two parallel universes have a nexus, a point in space where they overlap. Allowing you to be effectively in two places at the same time. So if I copy you into a machine, that copy process has all of the properties we were talking about as, as being a soul. When they talk about it, they say, is this even possible? If you made one, would it be conscious or is it just an empty machine? If you made one of me, is that me or someone else? What would actually happen? First of all, it's immaterial, because copying, that's not a thing, it's a process. It's immortal, it's just like you. You can put it in any environment you want, heaven, hell, make a simulation. It's not just about slavery, it's ultimately about enslaving your soul. Scientists working towards mapping and modeling the human brain have taken the first step by implanting a simplified mouse brain inside its virtual body. This virtual mouse, they say, could one day replace live mice in lab testing, letting them perform mock experiments with the same degree of accuracy. When certain stimuli are applied to the virtual mouse's whiskers and skin, for example, the corresponding parts of its brain are activated. Neurorobotics scientist Mark Oliver Gavaltic is from the Human Brain Project in Switzerland. That allows us at least in a simplified way to have muscles and senses distributed on the body, like touch is distributed across the entire body surface, and simple models of a peripheral nervous system that would allow us to control muscles and then interface between the brain and these other parts so that we get basically the whole animal reconstructed. Now, while this is what you would look like in virtual reality, this is what an M would look like when virtual reality. It's computer hardware sitting in a server rack somewhere. But still, it could see and experience the same thing. In a quantum computer, that device can be in this strange situation where these two parallel universes have a nexus a point in space where they overlap. The computer or robot controlled by a brain-to-machine interface can be very local, such as a computerized prosthetic arm, or extremely distant, allowing you to be effectively in two places at the same time. In addition, an M can make a copy of itself at that moment. This copy will remember everything the same, and if it starts out with the same speed, uh, listening, looking at the same speed, I might even be told, you are the copy. Every time you add one of these qubits, you double the number of these parallel universes that you have access to. Until such time when you get to a chip like this, which has about 500 of these bits, you have something like 2 to the 500th power of these guys living in that chip. But some things are different for amps. First, while you'll probably always notice that virtual reality isn't entirely real, to an M it can feel as real to them as this room feels to you now or as anything ever feels. 
So imagine a world where all of the laws of physics as we know them are obeyed, but different decisions were made along the way. Different decisions at the level of tiny microscopic particles, different decisions all the way up to what you just chose to eat for lunch, and whether you chose to come to this session or not. And, you know, while we experience this world in a certain way, this EM, or M, will experience life from the virtual world as its home, as its domain, as its place of existence. Controlling an entire artificial you, allowing you to be effectively in two places at the same time. And this is bizarre because we don't see those other things. But science has reached the point now where we can build machines that exploit those other worlds. And quantum computers are perhaps the most exciting of all of these. Because we can go from the ones and zeros in the computer to make DNA molecules, and we can read the sequence of DNA molecules and have those go into the computer, we can obviously interchange uh, through the digital world this biological information. That means we can actually now send biology through the internet. And it is upon this frequency superhighway that you can send data and information and instructions to the targeted individual much in the same way that you can send data and instructions over fiber optic cables that power the internet, for example. Brain-to-machine interfaces open up the possibility of avatar technology. Not simply controlling an external limb or a computer screen, but controlling an entire artificial you. And that's very much what's going on. They have unfortunately hacked the human mind, hacked the human brain and the human body. And it is once that, that super highway of frequency is set up between the device and the targeted individual, they can send instructions. And those instructions ride on the wave of frequency that it was tuned into the individual's resonant frequency. And then they can send instructions that manipulate thoughts, manipulate emotions, manipulate behavior, and manipulates um, even the vitals and so forth, the heartbeat, the breathing pattern of the targeted individual. And they obtain uh, remotely uh, an EEG readout of your brainwave signature. It's called a digital brainwave imprint. And they take that digital brainwave imprint, that, that copy, that digital copy of, of your brainwave signature, and they download it, or I should say upload it back into their, their supercomputer, which is actually a conscious computer and then they tie you to that conscious computer for life. How? By way of a continuous stream of energy, uh, of electromagnetic low-frequency waves that are specifically tuned to your unique brainwave signature. Nobody else on Earth has the same brainwave signature. It's, it's like a, it's unique to you alone. It's like a set of fingerprints. Nobody else on Earth has your same set of fingerprints. Well, nobody else on Earth has your same brainwave signature. And what the, the stream of energy is designed to do is it, it's designed to, to interface and interact based on that frequency, based on your brainwave pattern. And that's how it's able to speak to, it's able to speak to and decode the neurotransmitters in your brain, and that's how they're able to turn the brain of the mind control victim into their, you know, their very own visual, verbal, and auditive communication system. And an M can move its brain, the computer that represents its brain, from one physical location to another. M's can actually move around the world at the speed of light. And by moving to a new location, they can interact more quickly with M's near that new location. And man, that really taps into the whole idea of digitizing reality, the idea of having the spiritual dimension be virtually created, really, around us. This has been the race. You know, this has kind of been what they've been trying to do in the apotheosis in the you know the godhood that they sought and what the esotericists have believed is the restoration of eden you know so all those uh you know fairy tales and mythologies about living forever the fountain of youth and things like that this is sort of their technological answer to all that and it's quite fascinating to consider that again we live in this time where we get to see this unfold M's are crammed together in a small number of very dense cities. This is not only how they see themselves in virtual reality, it's also how they actually are physically crammed together. So at M speeds, physical travel feels really painfully slow. So most M cities are self-sufficient, most war is cyber war, 
and most of the rest of the earth away from the M cities is left to the humans because the M's really aren't that interested in it. Now I have to mention the part about compact cities. What's that sound like? Right? Agenda 21, now sustainable development for the year 2030. I mean, you know what? The whole UN thing sounds like they're just setting up for these emulets here. They're just building these cities for these emulets to live and we will basically become fodder or I don't know, just uh, energy sources like the battery in the matrix or something. It gives these computers access to these new resources, maybe you could call them parallel universes, in order to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. Basically, they turn the brain of the victim into their very own visual, verbal, and auditive communication system. It takes time, it didn't happen overnight. So the way I think about it is that the shadows of these parallel worlds overlap with ours. And if we're smart enough, we can dive into them and grab their resources and pull them back into ours. I could literally go into your head and see through your eyes and literally live through what he sees.